Amen. Well, good morning, church. It is so good to see you. For you guys that like are like, man, you know everything that's going on. You know that we kind of cut it short by one song. And the reason being for the next service, uh, we're having a, a we, we're not, it's not a baby dedication that we're having. It's a family dedication. And, and it's different because this family, if you can put their pictures up there, is the Chacon family. Uh, they will be dedicating their two girls' second service. And the reason I let you guys know is because when we do something like this, most of the time we do it second service. And you guys probably go, do we have not, no kids around here? It's like we have tons of kids running around. But we haven't done a baby dedication, a family dedication in such a long time because of everything that's kind of been going on. But I wanted you guys to know that this young family, um, again, they've been with us for a little over a year, but I've known them all his life. Um, we used to babysit him when he was a kid. And when he was, when he was a lot younger, him and his family used to be here. And then they, they kind of went somewhere else. And they've been back for over a year. And we've been wanting to dedicate their girls for probably almost two years. And then just things kept on coming up. And so today, and I wanted to share it with you guys because, again, they're part of our, fa- our church family here. And they're so excited to stand before the congregation and say that they are going to raise their kids up in the ways of the Lord. And, and so they are proclaiming that by, by doing that. And I wanted you guys to be a part of that as well. Because second service, we will be laying hands on them and the young girls and praying over them and just kind of dedicating them to the Lord. And I'm sure that they've dedicated these young kids to the Lord since the moment they, they were pregnant. But to do it in front of you, in, st- in front of the congregation, it's saying something about what they want in their lives. And so I just wanted you guys to know that. And if you guys are going, you guys only did not like four songs. You didn't do the regular five or six, whatever we do. And it's like, man, some of you guys are astute in that. So if you will, after being a, off for a week from the book of 1 Corinthians, um, make your way over to 1 Corinthians chapter 2. A couple of weeks ago, we got halfway through 1 Corinthians chapter 2, and this, this morning we will read the rest of it and, and, and finish off the rest of it. Um, our text this morning will be from verse 9 to verse 16, but I wanted to read the whole chapter as a whole to kind of get a flow of what the Apostle Paul um, has been saying. Especially if you were gone, if we didn't, because last week Pastor Daniel taught and I didn't. And, um, and, and so, again, just to kind of get the flow of what he's been trying to tell us. So, um, as you're making your way over to 1 Corinthians chapter 2, after we read through that portion in just a little bit, I will also be going over to John, the Gospel of John chapter 14. And I want to read a section from John chapter 14 because as I was studying, John chapter 14 kept on coming to mind. I thought, Lord, I, I, I truly believe that 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 portion will kind of drive us into what our text is really sharing with us and and give us a better understanding about even the Holy Spirit and what His role is in our lives. And and so that's where we're going to be. And so this morning, let's begin in verse 1 of chapter 2 of 1 Corinthians. It says, And I, brethren, when I came to you, did not come with excellence of speech, or of wisdom, declaring to you the testimony of God. But I I determined not to know anything among you except Christ Jesus and Him crucified. I was with you in weakness, in fear, and in much trembling. And my speech and my preaching were not with persuasive words of human wisdom, but in demonstration of the Spirit and of power that your faith should not be in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. However, we speak wisdom among those who are mature. Yet not the wisdom of this age, nor of the rulers of this age, who are coming to nothing, but we speak the wisdom of God in a, minist- in a mystery and the hidden wisdom which God ordained before the ages for our glory, 
which none of the rulers of this age knew. For had they known, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. Verse 9. But as it is written, I has not seen, nor ear heard, nor has entered into the heart of men, or man, the things which pertain, uh, which things, the things which God has pertained, prepared. <laughs> Let me read verse 9 over again. I was on a roll too, man. <clears throat> okay, verse 9 once again. But as it is written, I has not seen, nor ear heard, nor have entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for those who love him. But God has revealed them to us through his Spirit. For the Spirit searches all things, yes, the deep things of God. For what man knows the things of a man except the spirit of the man which is in him. Even so, no one knows the things of God except the spirit of God. Now we have received not the spirit of this world, but the spirit who is from God, that we might know the things that has been freely given to us by God. These things we also speak, not in words which man's wisdom teaches, but which the Holy Spirit teaches, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. But the natural man does not receive the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him, nor can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. But he who is Spiritual judges all things, yet he himself is rightly judged by no one. For who has known the mind of, Christ, of, of the Lord, that he may instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ. And so, Lord, we do pray for your blessing upon our time as we study your word, as we look at your word, Lord God. Help me in sharing this with my brothers and sisters. And so we look to you and we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. And so the Apostle Paul, he has been ministering to a very divided church, as we've been kind of covering already. And if you remember, he asked the question in the first chapter, is Christ divided? And the answer, of course, is, is of course not. Christ is not divided because no one could have done what he has done, and that is that we have one Savior and one body, and we are united because of what he did on the cross, basically. But he, 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 if he is not divided, then, then we are unified. We have to be unified. And so he, he reminds them of that, that Christ is unified. And he reminded them also of their baptism, which was a picture of a spiritual death, if you will, but it was a spiritual baptism into the body of Christ. And that no one was baptized into any other name except that of Christ Jesus, our Lord. And then he took them to the cross at the end of the chapter, basically. Towards the end. He, he, he takes them to the cross and he reminds them of, of, of what Christ did on the cross. And that is where all worldly wisdom comes to die. At the cross, because it is hard for them to make sense of the cross. The cross is what actually and, and normally can bring us life and unity. And, and so in John chapter 14, John chapter 14 kind of explains how the Holy Spirit brings us all together. And so if you want, you don't have to, but I'm going to turn over to John chapter 14, and I will start reading from about verse th uh, 15 to verse 26. And if you can, follow along and then understand what he's being said here so that we can take it into our text this morning. Jesus speaking, he is in the upper room with his disciples, and he's talking to them about what's about to happen. He says, if you love me, verse 15, keep my commandments, and I will pray the Father, and he will give you another helper, that he may abide with you forever. The Spirit of truth, 
whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him. But you know him, for he dwells with you and will be in you. I will not leave you orphans. I will come to you. A little while longer, and the world will see me no more. But you will see me. Because I live, you will live also. At that day, you will know that I am in the Father, and, and that you in me, and I in you. He who, has, he who has my commandments keeps them. It is he who loves me, and he will love me, and he who loves me will be loved of my Father, and I will love him and manifest myself to him. Judas, not Iscariot, said to him, Lord, how is it that you will manifest yourself to us and not to the world? Jesus answered and said to him, If anyone loves me, he will keep my word, and my Father will love him, and he will come, and we will come to him and make our home in him. He who does not love me does not keep my words. And the word which you hear is not mine, but the Father's who sent me. These things I have spoken to you while being present with you. But the Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all things that I said to you. So, so he gives us a picture, Jesus is telling us, that the Holy Spirit is vital. He is so vital in our life because it is him who teaches us the things of God. It is the Holy Spirit of God, God's Spirit, that he sends into the world so that now you and I individually can receive him and we have the Spirit of God in us. Jesus says, we will make our home in you. That is the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Because they are a triune God, however that might work, because we can't quite comprehend it. But the fact of the matter is that Jesus is saying, hey, the one who sent me, I will glorify him and I will die. I will do what it takes so that when I get back to glory, the Holy Spirit will now come and live inside of you. When Jesus was on the earth, he, he, he had flesh and blood. He could only be at one place at one time. But he says, I'm not going to leave you orphans. I'm leaving, but I'm not going to leave you as orphans. I will come to you. And that would be through the power of the Holy Spirit. What an amazing thing, right? And so this is what the Apostle Paul, again, he had just got done telling the, the, the Corinthian church when he, when he starts in verse 9 where it says, but it is written, I has not seen, nor ear heard, nor entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for those who love him. Again, what did Jesus say in John chapter 14? If you love me, you will keep my commandments. Those who do not keep my words do not love me. And, and, and so, so here, Paul had just got done explaining how the rulers of this age... Speaking of the philosophers and those who, who, who oversaw the people. Though the rulers of this world, basically, really don't understand or know the, how the cross works. How, that, how can that bring life and unity? How can that, how can that reconcile God and man and how can that reconcile man with man? How, how does the cross do that? And, and, and for that, he, he kind of quotes Isaiah 64, 4 to remind them that their worldly wisdom and or understanding will never allow them to capture the spiritual essence of what God has revealed through the cross. All it did, all that cross did was because of the death, because of the resurrection that followed, 
It, it, it was to bring spiritual understanding to man. Because unless Jesus goes to the cross, he, he cannot live inside of you. His spirit cannot. And, and, and so he takes all of that and he makes it into a thing to where we can understand because of who God is in us. Outside, he, we just couldn't. So Isaiah chapter 64 verse 4 says this, it, it, he kind of paraphrases it for us over here, but the actual scripture says this, For since the beginning of the world, men have not heard nor perceived by the ear, nor has the eye seen any God beside you, who acts for the one who waits for him. In other words, God works and shows himself active on behalf of those who are earnestly waiting for him. He, he, he's active in that. For those who are not waiting on God and wanting to know more, they are basically blind to that realm of who God is. And partly is because they do not have the Spirit of God in them. And so it's hard for them to understand because it is virtually impossible to hear God or to see God if you have never given yourself to God. Not just know, know of Him, but know Him. So There's so many people that would say, well, I know God. It's like, well, you know of Him. Because if you know God, that changes things in your life and you walk in a different direction. Not that you become so perfect, but because, of, because you know Him and not just know of Him. It changes our perspective and what we get to see and hear when it pertains to God. And most of it is because he gives it to us right here in your, in your word. Again, we're going to see even the Corinthians, they were in him, but they, they, were, they were immature in so many ways that, that they were ignorant of some of the things that God had for them. Because their growth was stunted because they didn't continue. They were trying to bring in worldly wisdom. They were trying to bring that in so, so as to try to have the upper hand because they had knowledge, they had wisdom, they had all of those things in the world. And they thought, well, I can just bring that into my spiritual life. Now, I'm not saying that God can't use our wisdom and our understanding from the world. But if we try to put God in the box of how the outside world views him, we're going to get stuck and we cannot see the things that he wants to, to show us or hear the things that he wants for us to know. There's a difference between knowing of him and then knowing him to have this personal, <laughs> intimate relationship with God. And, and that's where, where a lot of people stumble right there. They think, well, if I really give myself over to God, then he might change everything in my life. And guess what? That's probably not a bad thing. <laughs> Given the fact that we kind of mess things up royally. And, and, and most of us have tried, tried to do stuff in, in, in the world, and then we try to bring Jesus and then kind of attach him to our lifestyle and, and you're just never like growing or maturing in Christ because you keep on going back to the things that make sense in this world. And this is the difference of, of what he's trying to share with the Corinthian church. They knew him. They were in him. <laughs> but yet they were still causing division because they were bringing in their worldly philosophies. And trying to make sense of God, and again, which, which was causing them to follow that guy or that guy or that guy and just, instead of just following Christ. And they were bringing division within the church. The natural eye cannot see the spiritual realm. It is impossible to do that. Oh, there's a lot of people that, that will get into spiritualism, but that's not of God. Not the things of God. And they could see, there. Oh, oh my gosh, I see all of these things. It's like, that's demonic. You're being lied to. If God is not the center 
of any spiritualism, then, then it, it goes by the wayside because now you're getting into demonic stuff. And Jesus, it's, it's funny because the Old Testament never told us that wasn't true. He just says, stay away from that kind of stuff because it messes with you. But the natural eye cannot see truly the spiritual realm according to God's v- viewpoint. Nor can the natural ear hear and understand what God says in his word. Because the natural heart of man can only see and hear what is physical. How many times, again, I shared this a few weeks ago, have, did you try to write, read the Bible before you were a Christian and it made no sense to you? It didn't compute. And yet the moment you accepted Christ, all of a sudden it became alive to you. Because all of a sudden the Spirit of God is now teaching you. The things which God had prepared in that verse for those who love him. Again, the reason I wanted to go to John chapter 14 was to understand what God has prepared. And that was the cross. That was the death. That was the sacrifice that Jesus would have to go through in order to pay for the sins of the world. That's what God had prepared. Jesus had to go through what he had to go through so that the Spirit of God would be sent and would now live inside those who would receive him. And the scripture tells us in John chapter 1 verse 14, And as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God. People are not born into this. (laughs) You have to come to a point where you receive it. You come to the understanding. And oftentimes it's because we come to the end of ourselves. And we can't do this. And then we we ask and we cry out for God to come in. And he says, I will come into you. I will not turn you away. And so as many as, as, as received him, to them he gave the right to become sons of God. It says in verse 10, But God has revealed them to us through His Spirit. For the Spirit searches all things. Yes, the deep things of God. Once again, John chapter 14 told us how God would reveal truth. And that would be by the Spirit of truth. He reveals those things to us, which is the Holy Spirit who would not only be with us, but he would be in us. And there's a difference. It's almost like like you have a pitcher and you have a a glass, and the pitcher is with the glass, but the content is still in the pitcher. But when you receive him, he pours into you, and now that content is in you. And that's what happens when you become born again, that you ask him to come in. Now he comes, he's not just with you, but now he's in you as well. And that is what brings about salvation. Not wishing it, not desiring it, and never doing anything about it. It's asking him to come in and allowing him to change you from within. And I can guarantee you it will happen when this starts becoming real to you. This is where you will find what God wants you to know. Oh, you can hear it from a preacher boy like me. You can hear it from a Bible study on the radio. But this is what truly feeds you day in and day out. This is where we get our sustenance. I just get to expound on certain things. And I get excited about being able to do that because I dig in and I, and I want to go deeper so I can just share it with you guys. Nothing spectacular, I don't think. <laughs> but the fact of the matter is that you're going, oh, I never saw that. Well, you're welcome. <laughs> I spend hours and hours and hours. But it's only because my heart is, I want to know more. And for some reason, he's called the moron like me to stand behind a pulpit to share it with you. And if he could do that with me, he could do that with anyone. He truly can. And if you want to dig in and know the deeper things, 
He will show you. It's not gonna, he, he's not going to go, oh, I don't know, Suzanne. I don't think I can trust you with deeper things. He will pour into her just like he would pour into me, just like he would pour into you. God has revealed those things, and it brings about salvation. And so the blessing of salvation, the blessings of salvation were prepared by the Father. It was carried out by the Son. And it is applied through the Holy Spirit. Fantastic how God works that way. So that now all believers can come to a saving knowledge of who He is, and that will result in love for God. And to keep his commandments. Again, what, what was the first thing I read to you in John chapter 14? If you love me, you will keep my commandments. There's another portion where it says, and his commandments are not burdensome. And that's where we think, it's like, oh, I don't know if I could do that. Well, just love him. Just love him, and then you will desire to do what he has told you to do. It's not so much knowing them, it's doing them and walking in them. Because it's the, it's the Spirit that searches all things. And the reason that the, the Spirit searches all things is because He knows all things. He knows all things. There is nothing that He does not know or understand. Seen and unseen. He understands it all. Because He's infinite and we're finite. And yet... We are being told that, that it's the Spirit or God has revealed them to us through the Spirit. Doesn't make us superior to anybody else because we know the Spirit and He lives in us and He's sharing these truths with us. Doesn't make us superior to other people. But it gives us a different perspective. To see things that we could not see before the Spirit of God lived in us. So before the Spirit lived in us, we basically saw the world as everybody else sees the world. But once the Holy Spirit comes in us, then we can see through a godly lens of what the Scriptures tell us we can see. It, 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 it gives us a different hearing that we could hear with spiritual understanding because God has revealed certain things to us. Yes, he says, he searches out the deep things of God. There have been and there are many, many deep thinkers throughout our history. Profound ponderers, if you, if you will. Thinking of another one, but it's like, ah. Uh, <laughs> prolific philosophers. Is that a good one? Maybe? And yet, they have all been limited to and by finite understanding. It could only go so far. And, and we think as men, because we're so smart, and we, we now have a lot more technology to, to look, you know, to create certain things. And we're so excited. It's like, man, we could see way out there. It's like, but you can't get to the end of it, can you? Because every time you think, man, we've reached light years away. And I can't even comprehend that, right? But we have reached light years away. It's like, oh, just the beginning. You haven't even scratched the surface of who our God is. And so we think, it's like, but we know so much, but honestly, it is only temporal because you cannot know what he knows. And that's what frustrates the people with this worldly wisdom. They cannot get beyond what is physical, what we can see, even through a telescope. They can't see beyond that. It blows their mind. It's like, dang it, I thought maybe. And so it's like, well, there's a black hole. And you know that there's a black hole, but you can't go in it and go through it. And, and then try to reach the end of it. Because I think if you did, that's probably when you're dead. <laughs> because your mind would explode. Because we are finite. The deeper things of God are beyond man's scrutiny. It is beyond. 
And when we try to bring it in, he allows us to see and understand so much. <laughs> but we are finite, and our pea brains would explode if we got to see the infinite to understand what he truly understands and knows. He's given us what we need for this life. That's it. Oh, he's given us pictures of heaven, but I think the way it's written out for us, it's written out to where we can try to understand what heaven looks like. It kind of still looks three-dimensional. But I can guarantee you when we get there, you're going to go, whoa. Whoa. And like we sang that song, you will fall down and sing, holy, holy, holy. I think when, when, when Paul said that he, he had gone up to the third heaven, he says, it's not even lawful for me to share these things. Part of it, I think, yeah, they probably would have put you in the loony bin and said, you can't speak like that, bro. It's like, no, really, man, I saw this. But it changed him completely. And yet he could not put his finger on it he, because he, he had to still live on this earth. It is so profound and so bottomless that we can't understand bottomless. We think, oh yeah, I get bottomless fries at Red Robin. There's a limit to that. You know that. But to think of bottomless, you can't. To us, it has to have an end somewhere. And, and so again, it's not that we totally as believers understand all of this, the deeper things of God. We just simply believe it because the scriptures tell us that. Because God has revealed it to us and this is where worldly wisdom goes, ah, too, simp too, too simplistic. You can't just believe it like that. You have to try to explain it. And if you can explain your God, he's probably not much of a God. If, if, if he could fit in your pea brain up here, I, I, sorry if I call you guys pea brains, my pea brain. If I can bring him down to my level and understand all of my God, then he's not much of a God. And he, and he is limited because I am limited. The cross and the salvation that, is, that it brings is one of those deeper things of God that the worldly wisdom cannot understand. And thus it is foolishness to them. And anyone who believes that stuff must not have sense because it's nonsense to them. It says in verse 11, For what man knows the things of a man except the spirit of the man which is in him? We as human beings cannot know or fully fathom the thoughts of others. We can't. You don't know what's going on in my mind, just like I don't know what's going on in your mind. Well, I might, going, how long are you going to go? That might be crossing your mind. But we can't truly understand what's in somebody else's mind or heart. We speculate, but you're not him. Just like nobody can understand your mind and your heart. Because we're somewhat limited. Even if you told me your thoughts, I'm still somewhat limited to what you're thinking because you have more profound thinking than I could imagine. Because we are not in them and they are not in me. To fully capture the essence of our thoughts, somebody else's thoughts. We only know what is in us. That's what that scripture is saying. Even so, he says, <laughs> even so, no one knows the things of God except the Spirit of God. Oh, okay, we understand that. We can't fully know that, but the Spirit of God knows God because He knows His thoughts. He knows everything because He is God. It, it is His Spirit. And so even so... <laughs> In and of ourselves, as mere men, we cannot know the things of God. 
Because only the Spirit of God, who is in God, can truly understand what's in him. But here's the kicker. For those who believe or have become children of God, we have the Holy Spirit of God dwelling inside of us. What? If he is in us, like we are in ourselves, then he gives us an insight of God and what he thinks because he is in us. To know the things of God. We have the capability. Now again, not because you're so smart. It's because the word of God is so good. And he has given us salvation. And he has given you the Holy Spirit. Again, it all goes back to John chapter 14. Again, as I'm studying, I keep on going to John 14. I, I got to read it to you. Because he's saying, I will give you my spirit and we will make our home in you. And if he makes our home in us, does he keep things from us? He does not. He gives us everything we need for life and godliness. And it is through his word. He has given us everything about him. And so he says in verse 12, Now we have received not the spirit of this world, but the spirit of who is from God, that we might know the things that have been freely given to us by God. What God has revealed, we have received. In other words, God has not hidden what He has revealed. It's out there for anyone. People just don't want it. But there came a time in your life, in my life, where I said, I want it. I don't only want it, I need it. I am so desperate. And when I asked him to come in, guess what? He came in. I knew nothing about the Bible. I maybe had read it mm, a little bit once. But that's about it. I was raised in a Catholic home, so I heard certain things. I, I, I understood certain things. I know the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit kind of went together somehow and about Mary somewhat, but I didn't know anything. But what he had revealed, I had received. Now, it was there all along, and when I started reading this, it came alive to me. And for the last 41 years, I've had my nose in this thing. I can't remember, maybe in my early Christian walk, but I cannot remember going more than two days without being in his word, somehow. For, for being, to read it, not for you, but for me. <laughs> but he gives me the opportunity now, not only to read it and to understand it, but to be able to share it. So what he has revealed he has not hidden but he has given it to us and we get to receive it and we get to receive it freely human wisdom worldly wisdom stumbles at that point because oftentimes they cannot receive what they cannot make sense of the fact that he has given to given it to us freely by god they cannot understand God. They can't make him fit into this box that they've created for themselves. And it's harder for them to understand what is freely given because nothing is free. <laughs> to them, if there is a God, then God is a taker. He is not a giver. And, and the reason that they think that, because they don't understand how God works. Because if God is really God, then he wouldn't allow certain things to happen. And you see, that's what blows their mind. If there is a God, then why doesn't he do something about this? And so, again, they're trying to get God, put him in their box and saying, I could only, you could only be what I understand or what I can control. And God will not live in a box. He will not live in your box. He will not live in my box. He will not live in this world's box. And that's why when you hear these, these arguments that that is so far-fetched, why would a God do that? Why would a God do th those things? And, and you almost want to go, 
because he is a loving God and he has a purpose. And it's like, it doesn't work for them. They have to know that purpose. It's freely printed out, but that's too simple for them. They don't understand why God won't do what they want them to do right now. And that's difficult. And I think as Christians, we battle that as well. Oftentimes. What we do know is that we have freely received salvation because God gave His Son. And we understand that that He came to pay a price for, for something that we could never pay for. Oh, it cost God His Son. It did cost a lot. It wasn't free. It's free to us, but not to, his, not to, 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 to God. Because for Him, His Son had to leave glory, had to put on human flesh to become a sacrifice, and then He would have to carry the scars of that sacrifice for all of eternity. In other words, when he went back to glory, he didn't look like the way he came, the, the way he had always been, however that looks. But the scriptures tell us that he carries those scars today. And we will recognize the Lamb of God who, 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 who gave himself for the world. I'll probably jack that whole thing up. But again, he will carry and he has the scars today of the Lamb that has been slain. So it costs a lot. It cost us nothing in that sense, just to believe. And so in verse 13, he says, These things we also speak, not with words which man's wisdom teaches, but which the Holy Spirit teaches, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. Again, going back to John chapter 14. This is the study on John chapter 14. That's what we're doing. Jesus promised that the spirit of truth would teach us and guide us in all truth. He said, it is the spirit of truth who will remind you. But how can he remind you if you haven't first taken it in? So once you take it in, even just a little bit, he will remind you of that. Because that's who he is. And so so we have to carefully note the sequence here that the spirit taught Paul from the Word of God, which was the Old Testament that the prophets had written out, inspired by God, inspired by God. And then Paul taught the believers in word and also in letter, which would become the New Testament, so much of it. And so all the truth of God is found in the Word of God. And again, this is where people stumble. Well, how can you trust? That, because it's written by man. That's your stumbling block. You can't get past the fact that God is bigger and he can use people like you and me to to write normal men inspired by the Holy Spirit. And so it is very, also very important to note that these spiritual truths were given in specific words. In in other words, the Bible... (laughs) That we, we, we have more than just inspired thoughts. We have inspired words because the Word of God is inspired by God. And He is able to do that. None of this originated from man. We, we couldn't do that. If man truly wrote the Bible, guess what? You and I would look really good in it. Why? Because we never want to look bad. We might make other people look bad, but not me. And the, and the scriptures tell us how bad we are, but how good Jesus is. You see, if man wrote it, we would have said, no, nah, there's another way. If you're really, really good, and I know you are, because I'm really, really good. And if you could be like me, we can do this thing, folks. And it's like, no, we can't. That would be false doctrine. That would be preaching a different gospel. It couldn't be originated from man because it is taught by the Holy Spirit. In John 17, 8, as Jesus is praying to the Father, he says this, For I have given to them the words which you have given me, and they have received them, 
and have known surely that I came forth from you. And they have believed that you sent me. Jesus is telling the Father, I've given them what you told me. I give them your, my word, your word. And they've believed. And when it says here that they're, he is comparing spiritual things to spiritual, uh, to spiritual things with spiritual. This could mean that he's comparing spiritual words from the Old Testament with the spiritual that would eventually come through the New Testament, or it could also mean that it's interpreting spiritual truths to spiritual men. However way, either way, we have the Holy Spirit teaching the words of God to those who have received the Spirit of God. And now we can understand the things of God which bypasses man's wisdom because it's finite and he has given us something that's infinite. The fascinating thing about reading the words of God that are in the Word of God in the Bible is that when you read it on a regular basis, preferably daily, systematically, not just like, let me see what it says today. Just read, read through. Take your time. Don't read it like, like you're reading an article or something. Read it to say, Lord, how does this apply to me today? Not tomorrow, but today. What would you want me to know about you today? And, and to be able to, to pray and meditate on these words, I could guarantee you, if you're doing this to take it personally, not for your spouse, <laughs> not for that other guy, but for you personally, I could guarantee you it will transform your life because it is the Word of God. These words that are in here are God's words to you so that you can have everything you need for life and godliness in this place and understand that the Holy Spirit wants to teach you He's not going to hold back from you. He will remind you of the things that you read when you thought, I didn't get nothing of it. Because there's going to be times you read it and it's like, I have no clue, Lord. I don't, I don't know how that would apply to me. And then the day goes on or the week goes on and you're going, I just read about that the other day. And he teaches you. He reminds you of what you've read because it's in there somewhere and he brings it to you. It's one thing to know <laughs> It's another thing to do. People go, oh, I've, I read the... Whenever you hear people say, oh, I don't mean to offend you if you've said this. Oh, I've read the Bible all the way through and back. And it's like, really? And it didn't change you not one bit. <laughs> I don't think you read it right. I don't think it means what you think it means. Exactly. <laughs> Verses 14 to the end of the chapter here. But the natural man does not receive the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him. Nor can he know them because they are spiritually discerned. The contrast here that Paul kind of gives us here in these three verses is between the saved person and the unsaved person. Paul calls the unsaved or the saved person spiritual because the Spirit dwells inside of them. And he calls the unsaved person natural. And he says that because the Spirit does not live in them. Again, people say, well, we're all children of God. It's like, no, we're not. We're all born in his image and made in his image. But unless you ask Jesus into your life, you are not a son of God. Jesus said as much. When, when, when the Jews came to him, it was like, well, our father is, is, is Abraham. He says, if Abraham was your father, you wouldn't want to kill me. But your father's the devil. It's like, <gasps> I, I know some of you guys, I can tell non-Christians their father is the devil. They might punch you in the face. But again, it's something that, that, that again, let the Holy Spirit do that work. I don't know if I've ever said that to somebody, but I may have. Because you see, at one point, every Christian, every Christian was natural. Every Christian. We were all there. Even if you were raised in a Christian family, 
You had that sin nature in you. And so we're all natural. In the physical realm, we were all there. But when someone trusts in and receives Jesus as their Savior and the Spirit comes in, we move from the physical realm to the spiritual realm. And he gives us some insight and some understanding. This is what it means to become born again. Regenerated is the other term. And we are now able to live in the realm of the Spirit and grow in the things of God. Let me read to you from Ephesians chapter, chapter 2 beginning in verse 1 to verse 7. But you he made alive, who were dead in trespasses and sins, in which you once walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience, among whom we also we all once conducted ourselves in the lust of the flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, just as the others. Verse 4, but God, but God who is rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in trespasses, made us alive with Christ, together with Christ, by grace you have been saved, and raised us up together and made us to sit in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus that in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace and kindness towards us in Christ. That's how good God is to us. That we were all in the world and then he brought us out of the world and basically gave us a new life. The unsaved man cannot receive the things of the Spirit because he does not believe in them. Oh, he may know of them but he does not rely on them, adhere to them, and trust in them with all of his heart, mind, soul, and strength. And therefore, he cannot understand it. But as the Christians receive day by day the things of the Spirit of God, we can therefore now grow and mature in the things of God. And so in, in verse at the end of verse 14, it says, nor can they know them because they are spiritually discerned. One of the, the hallmarks or one of the marks of a mature Christian is discernment, the ability to, to penetrate beneath the surface, to look beyond what you see in the physical realm. Not that we're like looking for Satan around the corner and, and man, everything is spiritual. But there's an underlining tone in our lives that even in the physical, we could see things behind that which is a spiritual thing going on, that God has given us the ability to understand that there's another realm that goes on in our lives. And we can discern, not because we're that godly, because we have a different perspective, a godly perspective. So when he says that, the, that they, they are spiritually discerned, the unsaved person can only walk by faith, or walk by sight and not by faith. And he can only have a worldly perspective, how it might fit his narrative. And he really can't go beyond that. It, it would be difficult. He'll get into some other spiritualism, but not, not in the Spirit of God. And so they are spiritually discerned or blind, unable to apprehend and comprehend. It's difficult for them. But the maturing Christian, he grows in his spiritual discernment. And he de develops the ability, not in and of himself, but with the Spirit of God, to understand more and more the will of God and the mind of God. As we learn, some in the, in the Corinthian church, even though they were saved, they were immature. And they lacked the discernment and they had become, or they stayed at a, a spiritually ignorant, if you will. Not that they couldn't learn and grow, because we all can. I don't care how long you've been walking with the Lord, you can still grow. But the unsaved person does not understand the Christian. Because we're, we're, we're in two different worlds, if you will. We're still in the world, but we're not a part of the world. We see things differently. And the Christian, he can understand the unsaved person because you were once there. We were all there. 
And so verse 15 is not suggesting that the unsaved person cannot point out the flaws of the believer's life, <laughs> because they often do. It's, that's a kind of what trips me out. An unsaved person might not truly know the things of God, but they know what you should be doing and not doing. If you ever have an issue, should I do this or not? Just ask a non-Christian. They will tell you, just like you used to, well, Christians don't, don't do that. It's like, oh, so you do know somewhat, but they can't do it. Be that as it may. It's not suggesting that the unsaved person really cannot penetrate or enter into this full understanding, but something will have to happen in their life. Oh, they can judge, but at one point, they themselves will be judged only by God. But knowing all that as Christians, we know we need to be careful when, when we start understanding, wow, he's giving us insight not to become a spiritual dictator <laughs> to the saved and unsaved because, man, oh, man, you are so wise and so smart. Again, there's a humility that comes with walking with Jesus. There has to be. For who has known the mind of the Lord or that that they may instruct him. Paul quotes from Isaiah 40, verse 3 or 13, to help the mature, the immature, and even the unsaved to understand that God is above it all. There is no equal with God. No one instructs him. To have the mind of Christ does not mean that we are infallible. Or that we can start playing God in the lives of other people. <laughs> or even instruct God. I don't know about you. I think sometimes I'm big too, I'm too big to my, for my britches or too small for my britches. However that term goes. Thinking, let me tell you how you should be doing things, God. Nobody can instruct them. No one. But to have the mind of Christ means that we look at life from our Savior's point of view. We look at it with his eyes, with his heart, with his understanding. Having his values and his desire to do what he would do because we get to be his hands and feet and his mouthpieces. It means that we think God's thoughts and not the things of this world. Amen? Amen. Father, we just thank you and praise you, Lord, for our time together. We thank you for your word, Lord. I pray that I was able to, to do it some justice, Lord God, to remind us, Lord, of all the blessings that you have given us, Lord God, because of who you are, because of the things that you promised to give us, Lord, all because of what Jesus did on the cross. Lord, we understand, Lord God, what salvation brings, Lord, and it changes us from within. But I want to pray for anyone who is in this room right now, Lord God, who, who, who perhaps maybe in their lives have, have, have stayed in this spiritual ignorance, Lord God. They just have never grown because they've never really read for themselves. I pray, God, that you would instill that in their hearts right now, that, that whatever you have revealed is for them and they can receive it freely. And now they can grow to mature in the things that you, you have for them, Lord. But I pray for anyone who's in this room right now who does not know you, Lord. Not at all. And they know that, Lord. They know that they've really never committed themselves to you. I pray that right now, Lord, you would touch their hearts. And that you would do something in them that only you can do, Lord. We can't. But that you would touch them and save them. That, Lord, that they would acknowledge you at this moment. If that's you, because you know who you are, and I don't know your thoughts, just like we shared earlier. But God knows your thoughts. And if you need Jesus in your life right now, then I ask that you would just slip your hand up right where you're at, and I want to pray for you. And, and we have people up here that will pray with you as well. But is there anyone that wants Jesus in their hearts and lives right now? Anyone? Amen. I see your hand, bro. Anybody else? Father, we, we thank you, Lord, and we praise you, Lord. And I pray, God, that this brother who raised his hand, Lord, 
Lord, he would truly understand more and more right now, Lord God, because of, of just his commitment right now to say, Lord, I, I need you, I want you. That, Lord, you would change him from within and that life would look different because of your, your word coming into him through the Holy Spirit. And I pray, God, that right now, as, as we're praying, Lord, that, Lord, he would be asking you for forgiveness. That, Lord, you would just remind him of what you did on the cross for him so he can walk in the newness of life and call himself born again from this moment on. And so we thank you for what you're going to do in this man's life, Lord. And we pray for my brothers and sisters here that you would help us to grow in the grace and knowledge of who you are, that we, Lord God, might receive all that you have revealed to us through your word. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Let's stand as we sing this last song. If you need prayer for anything, come on up, get prayer. If, if you want to accept Jesus, but you didn't raise your hand, come on up and they'd love to pray for you. I love you guys. God bless.